All right, I'm back. A little brief intermission. I have really bad allergies. So, I'm gonna let our panel introduce themselves. So I'm gonna start here with Carlo, and then I will kind of kick it off with um, the first question. So this is more of a Q&A because I want it. So I'll get to the point about this event. Um, when I thought about what we should do, BETA, which is Black Entrepreneur Development Association, in partnership with the MOAS Center. That is our fearless leader right there, Anthony Blackshear. Um, so let me give you a little bit of insight of what BETA actually is. I call it BETA, but it's really bad, but we go on with BETA. Um, that's what we've been called it for two years. So the purpose of BETA is to help support... <laughs> the purpose is to help support um, new and emerging and up-and-coming small businesses with um, business formation, with tax help, with um, just more so helping you build their solid foundation, banking, um, connecting you with resources in the San Antonio to help you get to the level of these people here on this panel. So doing that, we host a number of events and workshops. Um, to date, we definitely, we meet at least once a month um, at a black owned restaurant or either catered by a black um, business because we we're not a black organization for nothing, so we want to make sure that we're supporting um, everyone in our community. So we do a networking lunch every second Tuesday of the month. Our calendar is getting, we're building and working on our calendar, but the whole purpose of every event that we do is really to help support you. So the theme of this trilogy, because this is the second event, there's one more after this one, is building better businesses. And how do we build better businesses? So we started with cocktails and conversation. As somebody that's a brand coach, it's important that I like to be different and do stuff that people haven't done before. How this thing would be in the first. So that event really kind of propelled us because what we don't do a lot is get to talk to each other. So that event allowed us to really have real, true conversation with each other. So this event I wanted to do because I wanted everybody that's here and who thought about coming to be able to know that they can reach out to anyone on this panel. They can call, email, text anyone on this panel if they really had questions about really scaling their business up because. I think a lot of times we go into business and we just go into business without necessarily a plan. But the plan should be to get to a six or seven figure business that either you're running or it runs without you. Um, but I know that's a little hard right now in our situation, but the goal is to get there. So this, um, this opportunity is for you guys to ask questions of them, um, for them to share their journey, their story, so you can see that it's definitely not easy. Because social media will have you thinking that everybody making a million dollars. And we're not. But we're on the way. But I think by hearing people that live in your community, this gives you, hopefully it gives you hope and this provides value to you to keep you striving and keep you going and know that you got people out there that look like you that have been successful in their business ventures since you know they started. Because I think you have moments of success. Till you reach the ultimate success, and well, that's whatever that is to you in your business. So that is one of the reasons why I wanted to put this event together because a lot of times we hear about these people, but we never see them. And there's a reason why we never see them. But it's I want to let you know that they exist, and for you, and I'm pretty sure as I speak for them, they can let me know. But I'm pretty sure they're open to you reaching out to them and connecting with them to really share and help you along the way. So, um, if you have a question, I'm going to put the mic. I'm going to turn the mic back this way. So, if you want to ask a question, you can just come up to the mic. Um, kind of start a little line. I'll move it up just a tad bit. But if you have a question and you want to come up to the mic and ask your question, um, and then whoever on the panel, if you want to ask it to a specific person, you can. Or if everyone wants to chime in, um, that'll work. So, really quick, if you can, we can go down the line. Everybody introduce themselves. Hey everybody, my name is Carlos Todd. I'm a real estate agent here in San Antonio. Um, I've been blessed to, I guess, get a lot of different skills in different areas, everything from marketing, um, automotive industries, you kind of name it, I probably kind of have at least some type of part in it. But I think the biggest blessing is just being able to kind of share what we do and, and how we've gotten to that point. That's it. Woohoo! Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, uh, my name is uh, Lynn Dixon. I'm the owner of Ruth Salad Kitchen. Um, I'm a uh, retired Air Force guy, uh, 22 years in the Air Force, so just kind of been around um, in the corporate world ever since I retired and um, wanted to, always had an entrepreneurial spirit, spirit, so 
Um, I got an opportunity to um, open a restaurant. That was one of the things I just dove in and, and did. Took a lot of risks. Never, never done anything in the restaurant industry before. So, um, so I knew it was going to be a lot of, um, a lot of heartaches, but I knew it was coming, and you know, I was just ready for it. So, if anyone has any questions about you know, how to start a business and, and get going and taking those risks, you know, I'm really happy to help. Hi right, guys, my name is uh, Daryl Smith. I am the co-owner of Wing It and Sip It, a uh, daiquiri place out here in the Wing Spot, uh, out here in San Antonio. Just made ten, just made eight years uh, in the business uh, as Wing It. Um, been, in the, been in the restaurant industry as an entrepreneur about ten years, um, and just willing to live, give anybody you know, inspiration. Like, you can do it too. Hello, everyone. I'm Sharika Arch, uh, president of Sharika Arch Restaurant. I am a general contractor who specialized in commercial construction, program management, construction management here in San Antonio. My name is Marie Gales. I'm actually the owner of Flawless Barbecue Station in San Antonio. I actually had a, a, a location in San Antonio, but I closed it, and now I'm expanding my church location. We're going to have a luxury spa in San Antonio. We're bringing some things to the church, excuse me, and bring some things to church that don't currently have in the area at all. We're going to have a beachy shower with body scrubs. We're going to have a sauna, salt room, um, some things that you don't see in that area at all. You have to either go to Bernie or, or New Brothels to get that. So we're bringing that there. I'm also the owner of Car Home Tutorial Services. I do um, mobile signing, and I also train notaries to, be, to start their own businesses in, in the notary industry. Um, I'm a photographer, and I also own a public business here. She making all the monies. Okay, so sis, did, did you cut me off? Okay. But I don't want to yell. Okay, awesome. So since the title of this event is How It Started versus How It's Going, let's just kick it off with how it started. So my question, and if anybody has a question after they all go through, come up to the mic, um, or you can ask your question from there. Just raise your hand so with one mic, one sound, or how we go. One man, one sound, all that. Um, so how it started. So what was your, when you decided you were going to do this and really become a full-time entrepreneur, what was your number one struggle? So, um, so when I when I first decided to go into entrepreneurship, right, and really, really pursue it full time, um, I was active duty military, still active duty, and I think that a lot of times people think that entrepreneurship is something that you just dive straight into um, without proper planning, without doing it the right way. So I ended up, as B. Michelle knows, I, I was networking around a lot for at least this six year stint, start building relationships, meeting people, just making sure that I was just putting my face out there and really, really, really just making myself known. And when I decided to go full time, I put myself in a position financially to where I didn't have to struggle. Um, a lot of people do struggle when they dive straight into entrepreneurship without having any backbone, not knowing how to navigate through the industry and really, really how to actually do whatever industry they're in. So I found a way to actually do that. I started building relationships. And I think that's the most important thing is just establish a relationship, make yourself a authority in your market and just really understand how you can set yourself apart from everybody else. And uh, that's, that's my start. Uh, I think for me, uh, me and my business partner, we were kind of looking at a business opportunity, um, like maybe a nightclub or, you know, something. A restaurant was like far from whatever. And then we had another friend, he was like, hey, I found this location. I think it'd be perfect for a restaurant. So this was probably, what, December of 20, 2020. Um, we thought about it, got the leasing for it, I think um, incorporated the business in, in March, and July we were opening the door. It, it happened that quick, just running through everything real quick. Uh, for me, uh, I think our biggest struggle was like, like really not knowing. Uh, for a little bit of background about myself, uh, I'm a graduate from Texas Southern University, my, my BBA in marketing. Uh, it came from a class project in my entrepreneurship class, which came about the idea. So I think the hardest thing was just actually, you know, taking this thing, this blueprint that I had on paper, this class project, and like making it a reality. So uh, not having the funds, not having, 
you know, the background, the, the rich uncle that, that could just give me that money. So I think that's financial, you know, finances was, was a big struggle, you know, going on. So, unlike everyone else up here, I, I dove right in it. <laughs> <laughs> and like you said, I was not prepared. Um, you know, I, I had funds, but I didn't have the type of funds to run a business and grow a business. It's totally different than just being in business. And, you know, once I decided I was going to scale to the next level, I started my business with an opportunity. I have an electrical engineer degree. And I thought I was going to do that for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. Never in a million years did I think that I would own a business and not a construction business. Um, I was afforded an opportunity to manage a construction uh, bond, which is multiple construction jobs. And I just took that opportunity, learned from it, and just grew. A, a part of it was my husband pushing me. You know, men are risk takers. They would jump off the building and fix a leg at the end of the day. <laughs> We're thinking about it at the top, like, this is going to hurt. Uh, he pushed and he pushed and, you know, I did it. And we made it through. We were blessed. Every step of the way, I've had mentorship and support and help. And as a woman in the construction industry, it's it's not one of those things where it's, it's easy, but it's definitely been very easy for me. I've had opportunities, tons and tons of opportunities to receive um, mentorship, sponsorship, trainings, uh, development. Um, we've been helped every step of the way. So it was very tough in the beginning because everything I did was a learning curve from having the right type of insurance, um, being able to get a bond, uh, having all my chips in a row to do anything that I wanted to do to get to the next level because when I started my business, I had already had an opportunity. So I didn't have to go and market and get anything. I made so much money, I didn't have to do anything. So after that, I'm like, okay, so how do I get the next one? And it wasn't that easy. I had to figure that out. I had to figure out, you know, who I really wanted for a clientele. Who was I going to focus uh, working with and chasing uh, work with? And the city of San Antonio came up, and that was a beast because the insurance requirements was more than you could ever imagine as a small business, as an entrepreneur. Um, thank you. Um, just all the specs, the specifications, just doing business on another level. Like, you know, in construction, you can go and build a porch or you can go and build a fire station. So I went from the porch to the fire station. Mm -hmm. That gap in between was nothing to play with. I lost a lot of money. I, lo I gained and lost a lot of people. Um, the, the relationships, I gained a lot of relationships because I had to be okay with asking for help. I had to go to the city and say, hey, you know, I'm a small business. I can't wait 60 to 120 days for my check. This is how I eat. This is not just how I do business. This is also how I eat. And they were okay with that. They are like, okay, we're wanting to help small business. We want more African-American contractors on board. How do, how do we help? And from that support, I was able to grow my business, you know, alongside growing myself at the same time in business. You don't always get the opportunity, but if you get it, I mean, mentorship is really big in being a successful entrepreneur. And if you're afraid to ask, that's where you're going to fail. Because you can't know anything that you don't know. You can't get to the next level if you're talking and hanging out and chilling with people that's not at the next level. Like, my mentors, they don't look like me. At all. Never. Because I always looked at, okay, how do I get to, you know, the million dollars? How do I get to the multi-million dollars? Now, how do I manage that? So the people I was hanging with couldn't help me with that. They couldn't even fathom thinking what to do with a check like that. So I started working with people that I felt was in position to help me get to their level and at the same time can tell me some of the bumps and bruises that they went through getting to their level. So I think mentorship is something really big. I didn't learn it until way after the fact, but if you can start it ahead of time, it'll get you a lot further quicker. It's cheaper too. So before Marie goes, I just want to interject, um, the South Central Texas Regional Certification Agency is, this is why that's important, because they were, like, she had to be certified, because when, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, a lot of times, even on the local level as well as state level, when they're looking for people to give out these contracts to, number one, being a minority helps you out, being a veteran helps you out, and being a black woman helps you out, but you have to be in the system. 
So they can't find you or they don't know that you exist if you're not in the system. But also the, what she said also is the networking with other people to help her get to where she wanted to go. You have to also be in those rooms where that is happening at as well. So I'm an advocate of getting certified. No matter if you don't think the city or the county will buy anything that you offer, get certified anyway. You never know when your, you know, your direction of your business may change. A little bit about my history. I um, I actually have a master's degree in information technology. I worked for Randolph Brooks Federal Credit Union for five years. Um, once my 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 job started interfering with my business, meaning I couldn't take on any more clients, I had to make the decision of it's time for me to step away from my job. And at that point, I, I did structure myself so that I knew at that point I had financial ability to to make it for a while before I started having because I I worked in my business for three and a half years before I started paying myself. And I, what I did was I was reinvesting the money that I was making. I was reinvesting it, building my business, um, buying cert, buying um, equipment, doing everything I needed to do to position myself to be ready to leave my full-time job. I knew I was going to do it, but I looked at that education I put in, and I was like, I don't know if I want to give that up. But, but my job was bit, was um, it was very um, stressful. And once I got to the point where I was stressful and didn't enjoy going to my job, I knew it was time for me to do something that I enjoyed. <laughs> And so I enjoy, I'm a licensed esthetician, um, spot owner, so I love what I do. My clients are awesome. Um, they love me. They come back on a regular basis. My staff treats my clients very well. I treat my clients very well. And so creating that environment for any kind of business and being a very professional person. Um, and, you know, I see so many times where people struggle with that in their business. They'll say, I went to a black business and they didn't give me good customer service. Customer service is everything especially in the spa industry. So for me, my struggle coming in was finding the right people. Um, having to deal with people who were unprofessional, having to deal with people who didn't um, treat my business as it, as it was their own. Anytime you come and you work in my business, I tell you, this is your business inside of my business. So I pay commission, so they make more money doing commission based versus going somewhere and working at, for an hourly wage at a spa. So I just allow them to come into my business and make good money while working and building their own clientele. So finding the right people to work in your business, don't allow people to come in and tear your business down from inside out. I did have that situation where I had to eliminate people and I had to set myself apart and I had to tell people, you know, you're not a good fit for my business and don't be scared to do that. Because that's when you, if you allow them to stay in, they'll tear your business down. So just make sure that you're communicating with them, that you're communicating with your staff, that you're having staff meetings and not just sending out text messages or group texts or whatever like that. Just have that face-to-face -face interaction and communicate your expectations as you're going through and building your business. Awesome, I think there was a lot of gems right there. I see people got their notepads and these pens. Yes, they came ready. So who wants to have the first question? I have a question. Okay, Kiana. I have to stand here. Um, you just said something. You said finding the right. Real quick, can I introduce yourself? Hi, oh, my bad. Hi, I'm Kiana. You're feeling here with Train. I'm Kiana Milam, actually, owner of Want to Go Fit. I save the world one pound at a time. Fitness CPR instructor. <laughs> Question for you. Now, I've been in business for years. Now, I'm no, I'm gonna say this. I was. <laughs> I. Uh, was working my business and was working in my hustle. And then maybe I'll say in 2015, I turned it into my business. Now, in the midst of that, I've had some, you know, other trainers, instructors, and so forth, but I really find it hard to find the right people. You know, um, uh, my, my business coach, she said, stop trying to find you. And I'm like, I'm shit. So then, I want to find me. You know what I mean? So, elaborate. So, I have, had, I have people who have been with me almost since I opened. I have people that have been with me as long as four and a half years. I've been in, well, four years. I've been in business for um, four years and seven months. I celebrate my five year point next year. So, um, I have people who have been with me for a very long time, and they are, they are just like me. If that matters, they they are, and I, it's not that I I don't go look for them. They'll find you if you if you if they're your right people. Mm -hmm. And so the people that I actually have with me who've been with me for two to five two to four years, I put an ad out 
I interview. I never hire anybody without talking to them face to face. I'm not going to do a virtual conference. I'm not going to do a, a over the phone. I want to see your spirit. I want to talk to you. I want to. I want to see what you're about. So when I when I interview people, I don't ask the general question. Well, what would you do in this situation? I sit and I talk to them, person to person. See what they're about. <laughs> see what they see what their energy is and all that. And then once you feel what their energy is, and you know if they're the right fit for your business or not. And I have some people who will fake it. And they'll fake like they're like that person, but you have to pay attention. And, and, and while they're working, if you have people that are complaining about things that they're doing, address that and stuff like that. So make sure you're communicating. But um, the right people will come to you when when they're ready to find you. But just hold to it and just don't don't just hire anybody because I don't hire everybody that I interview. Um, Liam or. Daryl, you guys want to chime in on that one? Because I know you guys do have um, employee staff. Yeah, um, in in about the year that we've been open, probably went through about 50 employees. Um, a very high turnover. Um, very rare to me. Like I said, um, I was in the Air Force for 22 years. We worked in the same corporate um, company for eight years after that before I opened the restaurant. So. Um, people like leaving jobs real quick is just something new new to me so but I kind of understand you know it's kind of at the price point where they're getting paid at you know I, I don't expect anyone to to work for me for ever you know now I know that you know they're probably gonna be there for about two or three months or something like that and I have to find someone else so I think it all depends on the you know what type of industry you're in um, we'll determine that. And then just add, add to what he said, uh, so we went through like, I said maybe 200 plus employees um, just, just just over this, this this time that we've been open. Um, and I think like, I, you can never really find the, I mean, we're st we still struggle with the, with labor labor issues. Uh, I'm, I was a cashier this morning, right? Sometimes you gotta, you gotta get in there. Sometimes I get, I'm, I'm still in there, right? But um, I think it definitely, being able to find those those right people is like like, like she said. I mean, they come either come to you, or you you know you got to just kind of watch watch who you you know start with interviews, seeing if that energy is is right. And I, I like to sit down and, and see and ask them what their what their five year ten year goals. What does that look like? You know what paint paint me a picture. What what why should we hire you or what you know? And also you know kind of giving them inspirations. You know we want a franchise. You know if you don't have a a, a, a ten year two year three year goal like you know hey we we, we have a, a goal of you know, franchising. If you you might be a our, our next you know franchise owner. You know, you can have this. You can do that. Um, so that's kind of something that we kind of I, I like to try to instill personally. Can I add on to that too? Mm -hmm. So um, one thing that I learned. So at our, at our car dealership, every single time I fly back in town, I'm always hiring a new salesperson, right? But I had to have an internal conversation, and the conversation went like this: You you teach what you know, but you reproduce who you are, right? So at the end of the day, sometimes it's a people issue, sometimes it's a me issue. But as us as leaders or us as business owners, we have to take that step back and look at the internal accountability and see what are we not teaching or not communicating. Because we, we all have expectations, but expectations are gray areas. So you'll expect things from certain people, but if you never communicate that directly, like, hey, this is the standard, this is exactly what I need. And then also to piggyback on what Daryl said, you gotta give them your vision of where you're trying to go, what you're trying to do, and how they can see themselves as being a part of that. And if they don't see themselves as being a part of that early on in the process, that's how you know that's not the right person. Because your people, just like what Marie said, you're, you're going to attract your people by who you are. So if you're, if you're attracting your people and you're doing things the way it needs to be done, inevitably by default, those right people are going to start to come around. But it's just all about working on the me, for, on the me part first, and then start working on developing the people around you. And that's how the whole entire game changes. Man, did you see how everybody wrote down what you said at first? I mean, that was really dope. So, yeah. I, I love, let me say this, I love to see all your faces. This is amazing because this is how we grow and this is how we learn from each other. One of the things that I found myself struggling with was as my practice began to grow and people started to come uh, and, and we grew, I found myself trying to work harder instead of investing in the, the providers and the people. Uh, and 
And so my struggle was, okay, how do I meet my overhead and all of the challenges that I have as a therapist while still working and mentoring and leading and coaching and teaching the, my staff? Because I, we, I have a vision and I want my vision to be adopted um, by them. And it's a challenge because um, just because I have a focus doesn't mean it's going to be their focus. And all of us are unique and we're all different. And so my question is, what are some things that you can share that you did to help yourself uh, in your specific or particular uh, area of expertise? Because all of us have different uh, visions, we have different goals, we have different scopes. And so it's, there's no one, two, three thing that you can do um, and, and then boom, you're gonna uh, be successful. There's a number of things you have to do and have people around you. So what are some things that you can share with us that we can take home and say, okay, these are some things I can work on to help not just myself that be better, but my people and my, my business grow. If that makes sense. So what has helped me in, in my line of business, which is construction, um, is huge. Um, and, and where I can go is, is even huger than, than, than me and today and my vision. So I always try to stay on top of the new things that are going on by attending conferences. I always talk about mentors because my mentors are the reason I am as successful as I am today. It's, it, it wasn't me because I had no clue. I had no idea. I didn't even know where to go. But I always tap into the next level of something. So. I'm always reading books, um, I'm talking to my mentors, I'm going to different conferences, and even if it makes me uncomfortable, you know, I'm, I'm joining boards so that I can understand more about a particular agency or um, a line of business that I'm interested in. And we do a lot of business outside of the state of Texas, so we have to network in those areas as well. So, you know, joining chambers, coming to events like this, has made me um, think outside the box because where I'm sitting next to another business owner, it might not be construction, but I can get tons and tons of ideas of how to do things different, get to the next level, scale my business. Scaling my business actually came from, uh, I, I went to a course with Goldman Sachs and it's called 10,000 Small Business, Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Business. And they taught me so much stuff. I, I went to entrepreneurial college I didn't even know that that exists. And uh, I think I was in Boston. I did it for six weeks. Um, it was a sacrifice that I had to do. You know, I have to step out of my business to work on my business. And a lot of us don't have the money to do that. We don't have the opportunity. But you have to kind of like step out on faith and, and really pour into what you want to do and, and able to take that to the next level. In order to get to the next level of anything, you have to be uncomfortable and you have to do something you've never done before. So that was my never done. Like, let me step out and, and, and take this class. Even though in my head, I know what I'm doing. I know business. I know how to make money. I've been making money. I'm, you know, I'm doing million dollar contracts. I can. I don't need this. But I, going there just changed my mindset. I'm sitting in the room uh, with, you know, people that are making a bunch of money. People that just started their company yesterday, but collectively we was able to share and grow with one another within six weeks. So stepping out and doing something different, I start with conferences because they're not as expensive, but those entrepreneurial courses and classes that they have all over the world are very helpful because it's not the information that they're giving you, but the people that you're surrounded with that you can network and get more information from. And I think that was a really good answer. The education is really, really key. Question? Yes. I love something you just said. I'd like for you to elaborate on that a little more. I'm Dexter Sandler, also known as the Money Doctor. I produce millionaires. And you said you had to step out of your business to step into your business. Can you expound on that? So it, it's funny. It's one of those things that you, you really can't see yourself doing because everybody's in business to make money. And you're either in business to make money to pay bills or, you know, help out other uh people in your business, because a lot of times that's what we're in business for. We're, we're making a paycheck for somebody else. 
to eat. But you have to step out of your business to work on your business. I wasn't managing it. I had to trust my staff that they were going to run the jobs. They was going to make us money. They was going to continue to grow the business while I get my mind together and, and able to scale mentally to the next level. Because you have to first be in a, a, a different space mentally to get there. Because you, you, you can't think about paying bills. You have to think about, okay, five years from now, how, how do I get five years from now? So you have to step out of the everyday hustle and bustle of eating. Because that's how you work as an entrepreneur. You're working to eat. And when you're serving and, and you're, at the, you're at the table serving 20 to 30 people, you're no longer eating for you. So you also have to think about that. Like if I'm not here, we can't make money. If you have to think like that, then you can't step out of your business. But you need to, to grow your business, to grow them. You have to step out of your business to work on your business. Yes. Okay. Step uh -huh. out. Like you're not in it every day. Mm -hmm. He's not the cash register. <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes he is. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. But you have to take moments to step out of it. No, true. I was just joking. I, I go to wing it and Daryl be like, well, how may I help you? <laughs> <laughs> um, anyone? Questions? Okay. Uh, hey, Jonathan, Liz. Um, I'm a financial services representative with uh, American. So I'm an independent contractor for financial services. Uh, my question is, when you guys first started out, anyone can answer. Um, in terms of prospecting or kind of getting your clientele and your team, what are the things you focus on heavily to kind of get yourself out there? I know you guys mentioned networking and conferences a little bit. But what are the key things you focus on to really expand yourself and get not only clientele, but also build your team? So my first and, first and foremost, my main focus is value. So a lot of times, especially depending on the industry, right? So you're in an industry where you're doing a lot of education, right? So how can you put position yourself as a person of value or an authority in your market? You have to educate people. So when you're doing this, I was just talking to John Trone. We, we had a really good conversation about just give the, game, give the game away for free, right? And the reason why is this. The more people that you educate, the more people are going to look at you as a teacher. They look at you as an authority. So now that you're consistently educating people, that's how you're going to position yourself for people to come to you and ask you questions because you gave the game away for free. Now, when you're giving the game away for free, understand you're not selling it to people. You're just educating them on the value of what you do. And if you can consistently keep giving the value, keep giving the education, your business is going to grow as a byproduct. But you just have to keep focusing on the value. Um, aside from, and then when you get into the team building aspect, it's all about that person, that individual, what they want, not what you want. So if you've helping people accomplish, uh, there's this old saying, right? Helping other people get whatever they want, you'll get what you want. So as you continue to focus on the value and then you focus on building the team, just figure out what people want and then how can you accomplish that by helping them and helping yourself? Because it, is it in alignment with your goal? The ultimate thing is just making sure that everything is in alignment. You want to get the right people on the bus and the wrong people off of the bus. And if you can keep doing that, keep focusing with value, keep focusing with education, and obviously positioning yourself to attract the right people, that's where your whole entire business changes. That's where your recruiting changes, specifically. Anyone else want to comment? All right, ne next question. Anyone else have, another, have a question? Oh, guys, come on, don't be shy. We got like all these awesome people up here ready to help you. Luminous, what you got? Can we talk about your main core values? Um, what you did in the beginning, what you didn't know, what core values you had to have in order to get where you got. Well, I'll be there, homeless. You just don't come with it, right? They might need a drink for this. We need, do we need an intermission? Are you just really pretty with it? That's what's up, though. That is a good question. Core values. Like, all jokes aside, that is like a bomb ass question yeah. and very, very important in your business. So who wants to start? I'll start. Um, so I am, I believe wholeheartedly when you're in business, you have to be professional first and foremost. So I, every interaction that I work with people, I'm professional. You can have fun and still be professional. I am very honest with everyone. Um, and I also, um, when I speak to people, and some of my clients are here, so they'll tell you, like, I'm very direct, but I'm also 
very kind about being direct, if that makes sense. So I get my point across in a nice way. Um, and so I, I believe in being honest with people and telling them not what they want to hear, but what they need to hear. So I like how he said what you started with and where you are today. So our, our core value started with um, honesty and transparency because in construction you don't get that a lot. And while we're helping our clients at the same time, we're helping the subcontractors as well because they're the reason we're eating and the clients is, you know, they're looking at us to give us that, give them the advice. But the last five years, our core values have just switched gears. It's still a good core value that we try to hold on to. Um, but we went more into alignment. Like we want to be more, in a, we want to be more in alignment with, you know, our staff, with our clients as well. We're able to pick and choose who we want to do business with, um, making sure that everything that we're doing and what we want to do as far as support and help and, you know, build your great project pro project or product, um, we want to be in alignment with you and what it is that you're looking for and what it is that we can give. I think for us, uh, and for me when I first started, you know, you, you think about, you know, just the money aspect and stuff like that, but as, as we evolved, I think the biggest thing is, is consistency, being consistent, making sure we have that, you know, that, that and, and, we still, and we're still learning, you know, we're still compared to these, these big giants out there of the world, but I, I think definitely being consistent and, and, and trying and, and kind of bleeding that into your, your guys to, to make the product, keep it, let's keep it the same, customer service. Um, I think those are our, our, our main principles. I'm real big on customer service. I came from a background working in, in the um, working as, as a waiter all through college, so I I, I took pride in, in being a you know that 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 great customer service, making sure oh hey whether it's from Capitals to Olive Garden, I try I, I work with the customer service. So when it comes to my business, I, that, that's why I pride myself on. I, I want you to go hey hey are y'all are y'all talking to are y'all engaging with the guys? You know it's just like when you're at, at a restaurant. If, if somebody comes in oh hey how you doing? I mean you're not gonna be you know they're not, they're not enthusiastic. You want to, I want that that charismatic, and I, I want I try to bleed that into my guys. So, um, for me, when I when I was in the Air Force, one of the uh, core values were service before self. So um, that that kind of always just stood out to me. So what I really try to do is just treat people how I want to be treated. Um, so one of the things that that we did when we opened the restaurant was we we try to welcome everyone to come in, and when they and when they leave out, you know, we say, you know, hey, welcome to Roots. You know, everyone says it, supposed to say it. <laughs> when I'm not there, I'm not going to say it. But even when they leave out, you know, or if I'm in there, I make sure I walk around, I talk to people, see how everything's going. And from there, we got, you know, great feedback from people. We changed, like, probably 180 from when we first opened just from the feedback that we got from people, from them, you know, trying our food, you know, they're like, hey, what about if you do this? We're like, man, it sounds like a good idea. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we did it. So just being flexible as well, being very open-minded and flexible is key. So when I first started out, I had, um, I had three core values that I like kind of live by, right? Um, there were worry about yourself, keep your eyes on your own paper, live your truth. And as I started to get more involved in business and grow in business, understand, you know, nobody's perfect. And we're all consistently growing. We're all consistently getting better. There's situations, things are going to happen. It's inevitable. So I started to realize when I started to develop a team and really, really have people that were relying on me for information and education and learning that it's not worry about yourself, right? You have to make sure that you take care of the people that are around you so therefore you can take care of yourself. Because if you help enough people get what they want, right, you'll get whatever you want. So my focus now has been communication over expectation. There is no gray areas. If I communicate with you and I tell you exactly what's going on, you don't have any gray areas to expect anything. You just have to go based off of the conversation. So that's the first thing, communication over expectation. The second thing is, uh, is clients first, right? Take care of your clients. Because at the end of the day, if you take care of your clients, they're gonna take care of you. You want your business to grow. How many people did you truly and honestly take care of to the best of your abilities? Did you give your best? Did you try your hardest? If you did that, your clients are organically going to start to refer you business. I had one day where I had five referrals from one client just making a follow-up phone call. 
I called her, checked on her, how's the property going, how's everything going? She's like, it's going great. I told her my goal for the end of this year is to do X, Y, and Z. She said, oh, have you talked to this person? Have you talked to this person? Have you talked to this person? Started naming off people, sent me name, phone numbers, and contacts. Why? It's just because I put them above myself and I focus on helping them get whatever they want, which is their home, but also just consistent value. Me and me, Michelle had a conversation. We were talking about follow up versus follow through. That's another one. So a lot of times we follow up, follow up, follow up, but what happens when the transaction's over with? You gotta follow through to make sure that they're taken care of, make sure everything's going good. Then you can ask for the additional business on the back end because you follow through. And those, that's me, those are my principles. Wow, I think that was really good. Did y'all write that down? Somebody gonna send me these notes. But well, we're recording it too, but somebody can send me these notes too, but I'm not gonna remember all this. I can actually attest to, somebody had a question? A follow up? So I will say that I'm, I have patronized at least three of the five, four people, five people up here. And I can honestly say that it really does happen the way they say what they just said. And so I think consistency like this is really important when you come into a place or whatever it is that you're doing. So I just want to say they're not just up here saying stuff because I'm pretty sure some of you probably have patronized these people as well to be able to vouch for it. I think it's important that we really be open and honest about even the struggle of just running a day-to-day -day business. So sometimes you have off days, you know, and it happens, but consistency is key. You want to hit your follow-up? Yeah. Do we need to pause for a drink? Cause that first one was, <laughs> okay. Okay, go ahead with your follow-up. Okay. Uh, following up with your core values. Uh, one of the most important things is our foundation is our community. So can y'all please tell us um, how you found out how important your foundation is Okay, so before you, whoever comments, let's just take two so that way we can have a chance to get a couple more questions. So if you don't mind, can we just have two people respond? Sure. Okay, so whoever wants to respond, go ahead. Um, I'll, I'll take that. Um, when I moved back here, 2000, probably in 2018, um, one of my real good friends, they, they have an organization here in San Antonio called um, Icon Talks. I don't know if anyone heard of it or not. Um, but we do events like monthly, uh, big events yearly. Uh, we used to, um, at MLK Academy, talk to the kids. They used to you know, bring in someone um, like yourself, come in, talk to the, the kids, uh, middle school kids, and just basically where you come from, where you at, basically what we're doing now. Um, we feed the homeless um, every year for Thanksgiving, uh, Coke Drive, um, toy drive for Christmas. Uh, we just did a book bag drive at uh, Kemp Academy. Um, 500 book bags for kids with supplies in it. Um, so giving back is like open up everything for me. Um, it's, it's like a whole new world um, just to be able to have the opportunity to do that. So um, that's, that's real huge for me. All right, anyone else want to really quick? 60 seconds? I'll tackle it. So, when it comes so much to community, everybody has to really look at a couple of different dynamics, right? So when you're talking about community, are you referring to specifically our community here? Or are you talking about in general, right? Okay, perfect. So I'm glad you said that. So in, in a general sense, my biggest thing has just been education, right? As much as you possibly can educate people and provide value, that is the key. Irregardless of uh, the, de the demographic, you just have to consistently keep giving people that information because Information, I got this from one of my friends, information changes situations, right? So the more you can consistently educate people, the better they're gonna be in regards to making the best financial decision for themselves. So no matter what industry that you're in, if you're giving people the resources, I don't know how many people are on like social media, right? Y'all see all these TikToks, Instagram, short reels that are going around where people are just giving information, information, information. Why? It's because they've become an authority in the market and they're providing value. The more value you provide to the marketplace, the more money you make. So that is, for me, my biggest thing is just education. And it's not just in a sense of real estate, it's in a sense of business. I've had so many conversations with different people in this room and outside of this room, just business conversations. Like, hey, do this, do this, do this. You should start here, start here, start here. And that's the key. That's, for me, that, I guess that's why I got a good relationship with a lot of people, just because I come straight out of a value space as opposed to a monetary space. And I just want to give as much as I possibly can because at the end of the day, that's where the whole entire game changes. That's where you position yourself and you can completely build everything you want from it. So don't be transactional. Don't, no, don't not at all. No, 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 no. 
transactional is what kills you because exactly. if you're only transactional, what happens at the end of that transaction? There's no value there. They might have gotten the they might have gotten the material thing that they wanted, but there's no value exchange. You want to be in a space where you can approach somebody within 60 seconds and provide them massive value. Why? What happens? Immediate credibility, immediate authority in your industry. You, but you have to know your industry, you have to know your product, know your service, and then be able to cater it in a way where anybody can understand it, or you can <laughs> position it to the way that you want to uh, kind of give this information to the person. So if you have someone from a different background, different industry, you want to kind of understand their culture and the way they communicate, and then provide your service or value in that way to where now they're looking at you as the authority in your space, and they can also be able to rely on you for whatever it is that they need. That's why you gotta be a SME. Subject matter expert. Thank you, Carlos, for that. And our panel, so let me just say this thank you to our panel for giving out such great. Are y'all enjoying this? Yeah. Like, it's just, I mean, like, a lot of value. That's Carlos' word. I'm just going to deem value Carlos' word. But, like, you're really, I feel like in an hour that we've been doing this event, thus far, has been a lot of value given. So I hope that you guys feel the same way um, as well. Sharika? Just real quick, I just want to say I did not give value and the community when I first started because I was, you know, project, money, growth and development driven. And once we started providing opportunities to our youth, um, it changed my mind tremendously. Like we, right now it's like a, a must that we are mentoring and hiring interns throughout the year because it, it, it has really changed how I felt the impact that we can actually give to our community. I mean, no one really had opportunity on the east side, and our business is on the east side, uh, with our kids. And we started giving those jobs and started actually pouring into them to where we had parents come and ask for jobs because their kids are coming home and telling them about the wonderful experience yeah. that they had. And that touched me more than anything. And even the kids not even knowing truly what construction was and had people in their family in construction that also was a game changer for me because i'm like you know i have kids my, of my own and i kept saying man you know if someone is not going to reach back and help and support my kid they would be just as lost so that was something that was really important that we incorporate every single year um, is the internships and making sure we're spending time with our youth and development because workforce right now sucks <laughs> but I, I feel like we put enough training to where it's coming back and I feel like it's coming back my guys have to work much harder and they hate it when I bring uh, youth onto the job sites but I feel good about the ones that want to grow want to develop and want to change their life for the better it's really important yes. so I'm going to go over here um, Mr. Webb has a question, but I want to say just so we are a good steward of everybody's time, um, make sure we get our questions out quickly, and so that way they can answer quickly as well. But people are looking at their watches, so I don't know why. Go ahead, Mr. Webb. This, my question is more about their, their, like, franchise. Uh, franchise, and they're looking for franchise. Uh, is it a uh, I think right now it's still a challenge because. Um, they, they say you want to be great, you study the greats. So you know, we're constantly looking at the, the, the biggest thing, like, you know, we think of daiquiris, we want to be the, the next smoothie king of daiquiris, right? We think about the wings, we want to be the next wing stop of wings. So in, the, in that regard, like, so I think it, it, it definitely comes emulating those processes, right? They have, they have, uh, they have consistency for a reason. They, you go in each of these McDonald's, they all look alike, right? So you want, we want to mirror that. So I think it starts there. It's kind of, you know, I'm looking at these big guys. This, this is where I want to go. I see these my, my Rushmore of, 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 of business, and, I, and, and that's what I kind of put myself on that same. You know, you don't, don't, look, don't look at the little guys. I want to, I want to get, get compared to the, to the big guys. So that's, that's kind of what. So do you base your, your location on demographics? Uh, no. Right now, I think, like I said, we're, we're early on. Since we are only one franchise already, which is we're starting in Austin, um, I think we're, we're, it's kind of open. Right, we're, we're at the point of like, hey, where, where you wanted it in a sense. But at the same time, we don't want to just kind of put it out there, just throwing anybody who got money could open open up something. We want we want somebody. So just just a little short story. So our first franchisees got granted. They were actually uh, managers at our in our first at one of our, our locations. So he, he they actually worked for a year uh, as a manager in there, learning the system, learning the process before they even got deemed their first location in, in Austin. So definitely. Definitely, you know, going back. So, 
But just most people do it to your demographic question. I think um, most major uh, companies, they really do look at demographics, not that, because it's about funding. If you look at even San Antonio, where a certain restaurant like Whole Foods, there's a reason why we only have one, possibly, and it's in um, with the quarry. So a lot of sometimes people do look at demographics based on the target audience of their um, their business, which is another thing about target audience, which is super important um, to know as well. Who is? Hold on, let's, let me go back here. Go ahead, Vanessa. Hi, I'm Vanessa Winston. I'm a professional makeup artist, and you check around my filter. Um, so I think about this all the time. Your point to like reaching back to the kids. I'm a teacher as well. And I always see students that are doodling on their paper. I knew I never knew that I was a makeup artist past college, but I was a makeup artist the whole time. I was scribbling on my work. I loved art class. I was very creative. I didn't know what a makeup artist was. I had no access to that. So that's crazy. And it really does change things. And you need to save money. Um, the other question that I have for you all, the whole panel, is I think about this and I think about belief comes before growth. And I'm wondering what your first or your long-term goal for your business was at inception and if it's changed or, and if it has, why? So um, two people can respond. <laughs> <laughs> so I can I can talk to this a little bit because I my initial changed once I because I, I had two locations at one time. And it took me a lot to say, I'm gonna close this one and just focus here because when I was in San Antonio, um, I had a really tough time staffing that location and getting good people who wanted to come in there, who wanted to treat the business like it was theirs. And I live in Universal City on the northeast side. And um, and when I open in shirts, shirts pass San Antonio location within three months of opening. So that told me where my market was. And so I had to make the decision at that point and say, okay, how long do I want to start keep pouring into to, to, uh, San Antonio location? And I did it for about six more months. I tried to see if we could staff it properly and try to keep, you know, and then at at one point I just said, okay, so I'm just going to only focus on shirts. And then the space in front of me became available. And when that space in front of me became available, the first time the, the owner of the building leased it from under me before I could get it. And the second time it came available, he came to me because Dimitri, the owner of the Purple Pig, told him, you hit Marie wrong the first time and you need to make it right this time. So when he told him that, he called me when it became available. He said, Marie, that space is available. Do you want it? I said, yes. So at that point, I was like, I'm going to close San Antonio. And sometimes as a business owner, you feel like you're failing when you close something and have to open. But the business that I'm getting in shirts, I kid you not, far exceeds the business that I've had in San Antonio. Mm -hmm. And then bring, being able to bring something different to that area that's not in that area is going to catapult my business beyond where it is right now. So as a business owner and as, a, as somebody who's, who's had to go through that like close phase and reopen, I've closed, I had a, a salon and, and, a, and a spa, and the spa did not work with the salon. It was way too loud in there, but I had to make that decision that this is not going to work for my business, so I opened up a spa standalone. And when I did that, I noticed a big difference in my business. And so it's just, you have to learn like where you are, what you want to focus on, and then if you need to eliminate things, eliminate them and move forward. So I can tell you I am a licensed esthetician and I was trained by Michelle Obama's esthetician. I bought her in San Antonio. I met her in, in, in Atlanta a few years ago. I called her up. I said, hey, Joelle Lee, will you come to San Antonio and teach our estheticians here? There's only three of us in San Antonio who are trained by her. And so when I talk to my clients and I tell them I was trained by Michelle Obama's, some of them have actually reached out to her and she's communicated. She's one of my mentors in this business. So, I mean, it's, it's important to talk about those things and tell people who you are training. When she talked about training, train, train, train. I go to conferences. I've been to Atlanta. I've been to Chicago. I've been to um, Arizona. I've been to... Um, uh, gosh, uh, several different places. So it's just, I, I get as much knowledge as I can. And I hire new estheticians out of school. Not a lot of people will do that. So when people go to school, a lot of places require them to have one or two years experience. I don't require that. All the, all the education that I pay for, I pour that into other people. And awesome. so, being that. Thank you, Marie. Um, Mr. Ward, and the, I'll, I'll, Kevin, Kevin, and then Mr. Ward. Kevin? I have no. 
uh, also known as K Status, I'm the owner of uh, Status Thousand Cuts um, Barbershop on the highway. But I have a question about balance. Mm. I'm really struggling. You know, somebody, I'm, I'm really talented. I'm really talented in a lot of areas. I have a lot of ideas, dynamic skill set. Um, outside of being a barber, having to be there all day, because I'm the only one there. Uh, also doing a podcast. Um, Got a YouTube channel. Do a little mentorship on the side. Uh, how do you find balance? What in, 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 in how important is it to take on? <laughs> yeah, man. Daryl is, 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 is the one for that one. <laughs> so, so, so I'm gonna uh, put it into it because I know he got it. Hold, hold on, Daryl. Um, especially after COVID, so I opened up during COVID. So a lot of you, a lot of y'all have uh, businesses that was pre-COVID. How has the adjustment been for post with employees? All right, Dan. <laughs> added to that, the, the last part. So uh, it, it, was, it was tough going off at, at first. Um, we were actually blessed, man. We opened up. Um, and then adding up to the last question, they were talking about like where we see our business. So my business started from a food truck that evolved to a restaurant, that evolved to a daiquiri spot. But it all came from a class project. And in that, in that regard, so with, with, with that business, um, it, it grew, um, lost where I was at. What was your question again? Yeah. <laughs> 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 COVID, all right. So, uh, so, so when COVID hit, um, it, it definitely took a turn for us, but we actually opened our, our daiquiri spot. So i say January of 2020, um, and then the, the pandemic hit uh, March. For us, it, it was a blessing because we did the best numbers ever. It was a brand new business. We took a, you know, took a chat, took a, uh, uh, we had lines down the block. Um, it, it really was a game changer for us, and it it, it, it evolved us quicker. Like I said, we, we started with with daiquiris in our wing spot, and then once with COVID, it just it, it, it erupted. So um, with that, it was hard as far as um, on the wing side because the price of wings went up, the staff, the labor, like, nobody wanted to work, everybody wanted to drink. <laughs> that was good, um, but it, it kind of was, you know, it, it kind of was the opposite with the wings. Um, and to, to add on the balance, uh, I, I think like you just kind of, you know, for me, you know, having having the faith and, and just trying to have having a having a partner, I have a partner. So we, we kind of balance each other out. Um, he's more of the financial guy. I'm more of the operations. So I think having uh, the, the right circle around you is definitely is definitely key um, to to that balance because sometimes you know. I, I can't handle this this stuff over here. I, I got my partner that, that, that can handle that, that, that aspect of it as well. So since I don't have a partner, what would you suggest? Get a partner. Have an assistant. Hire a virtual assistant. Hire an assistant. Yeah. 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 All right, so let's, let's get a couple more in before we have to wrap up. Charles, Charles, did you have a question? Yes. You have a comment to unwind me. Okay, I'll be sure on the question. Okay. I did want to make me about the focus panel represents success. And one of the things I really would like to hear is a glimpse into the B panel. Unless you guys all the exceptions and you successful the first time out of the game. But with that said, Bob, if you're up there, I would really like to hear a good, I guess, launch for us in terms of keeping us inspired about the rebound. Um, what that was like and what was the what was the tool or tools you used to propel that or use that energy from that crash. Alright, who has a good rebound story? One person. Yeah. One person. Who has a rebound story? So I don't think a rebound is a good story. It's just how we made it out. Okay, go ahead. Um, who? So I have rebounds all the time. I've been in business for a um, little 15 years. Uh, it's kind of reinventing your business. Um, finding something new and creative and, and different that you can actually provide or offer. Um, I can't say that my rebound has ever been great or large, 
but it's always you're always having to reinvent and, and do something different because you're gonna plateau you're gonna um, be at a standstill the growth might level out you have to figure out okay what is it new that I need to do do I need to find different clients do I have to hire better people a great rebound for me is when I decided to actually spend money on my employees um, we had to actually hire higher level employees to help us you know get to the next level help us scale help us jump back up because we have plateau and we plateau a lot in construction you can get um, really comfortable because you're so stressed and when you don't have any stress you're like okay I'm good but good is not always great because you won't grow so we have to always find something different be creative um, <laughs> Yeah, that's my question. What? Oh, no, go ahead. Oh, yeah, so the, the stagnant part of business is just being comfortable. And, and being comfortable is not where you make money. You don't make money in a com comfort zone. So you get there so that you have less stress, but that's not necessarily mean that you're growing and scaling and making more money. So what helped me get to the next level is having better employees and, you know, having to pay the, for the better employees. Thank you, That was some good info. Did she answer your question, Mr. Ward? Yes, I appreciate it. Okay, JR. Quickly, quickly, quickly. Okay, my name is Jina. I'm the one of the people. I'm going to be able to listen to all the people. I'm going to be able to listen to all the people. I'm going to be able to listen to all the people. I'm going to be able to listen to all the people. I'm going to be able to listen to all the people. I'm going to be able to listen to all Feeling. If I hold on to it for too long, I was going to sleep. What was the best to learn? Sell it and then do what you have the best to accomplish. That's what I did. I saw the decision, I focused on the record. You got to make the decision. All right. JR, quickly. That was part of what I was going to ask, like, rebounding on all of them. Um, so I'm JR, I'm JR Day. So I'm actually post COVID um, business, uh, business owner. So I have multiple businesses from nothing to years after your businesses. So my, my question is, with all of you right now, so I know how you want to keep money within the, the black community. You want, to keep, you want to keep money within your team, your eight months from day ones. You want to keep it with your real ones. So. I don't think they care. I don't think they care. No, 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 no. Here, here's, here's, here's the first question. Because you guys are already see me so in the salon right now, my social media and then there's other shit that I'm just, oh, sorry. <laughs> but uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, see, this is why I'm not the representative of my business. But no, but I'm, I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm, just being, I'm just being real. So like, like for me, I already know I'm not professional, but I know that I'm good at what I can do. So my, my thing is, is where I am, like right now, because I'm at the brink of success, I'm dealing with a lot of top tier clients, and my team that I started out with, the A1 from day one, some of them right now, we came from nothing. Like this, they were meeting in coffee shops, and now we're, now we're in like nice, extravagant offices and all of that. But the thing is, you guys were talking about, hey, you know what, um, character, you know what, when to cut people off. So my question is, how do you know when your partner, employee has has reached that 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 mark where you got to cut them off. You know what I mean? Because my the thing is, I'm I'm gonna be I'm gonna be real with you guys. So okay, I gotta put a pen in because we got two more people. But I'm gonna let somebody answer. But but you you know our boy, right now. You know what I mean? Like when it's coming in, you want to bring it up with your partners, but everybody can get the business. We bang on the business. Gotcha. So one thing I'm gonna recommend to you, right? Everybody can take this down. There's a book called Good to Great, right? That book absolutely from Good to Great. Who's your author? It's not pull that far. So, so the book, the book is called Good to Great. It's great, right? And those those that know what I'm talking about know exactly where I'm getting ready to go with this. So one of the things that you have to realize, right, as your business is growing, as your business is scaling, because you're very successful in this space, right? Thank you. You're very successful in this space. So now that your business has reached a, reached a point, every, everybody serves a purpose, right? Every stone on the path serves a purpose to your journey. So these people that are going with you as you're growing your business, they probably can't go directly to that next step with you. 
Correct. So with that being said, you as the business owner, you have to make a decision. Everything, everything is, is a choice. It's all a decision. You have to make a decision and say, okay, this person has served their purpose in that season of time frame that we're in. They might even still serve other purposes. They might be great in other areas. So what can you do? You can delegate them to another position of the company, another position of the business, while you go in and bring in new talent, hire better people, and have them come in to assist you with handling those top tier clients. It's not a, so, it, and it also depends on the, the structure of your business, because if they're business partners, that's one thing. But if they're just employees of the business, you as the business owner, you have the responsibility to ensure that your business is going in the direction that you need to. You need to hire and fire according. So, it's partners, so do you, do you pay them off for a percentage, or you know what I mean? You have a conversation. You have, you have a conversation. So communication over expectation, right? You have the conversation. No, seriously. So, so this this is good. This is good. You have the conversation. The conversation goes. Exactly. So, so the conversation the conversation goes into this space, right? They're partners. So this is what you do. You say, hey guys, look. In this area of the business, we're excelling. We're growing. We have this 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 caliber of clients. I know personally, as a business owner, I know personally that who's better suited. Do you have the conversation like, hey, look, based on all of us here at this table, who's the best suit to handle this aspect of the business? Because you have different areas of business where some, everyone's a leader in their own area of function. So if they're good and great at this one particular area, have them, have, have them handle that area. While you step over and you focus on the high level clients because that's what your expertise is. Unless you want to buy them out of the company and get them out of the picture, that's one other aspect. But if you're in that space where you want to delegate those tasks, and say, hey, look, you handle this, you handle this, I'm gonna handle a high level, we're all gonna eat and make money at the end of the day. That's how you tackle it. So in all seriousness, all, all jokes aside, I'm, I'm serious right now. Um, what Nicole said about the buy sell, like, buy sell agreements, it's really important in your business. That's why also your operating agreement is very important and that it line out when it's not working anymore, you can go right to your operating agreement. It's like most nonprofits go right to their bylaws, this line says X, Y, and Z, and it's a wrap. So this is one of the things that we don't do well sometimes as small business owners, have an operating agreement. Even if it's only you as a solopreneur, you should still have an operating agreement because you're setting the foundation for the growth. So have an operating agreement that outlines what partners should be on. If they're not doing X, Y, and Z, I will take a word from my brother. He's very good about these whole personality tests. It's really important that you do a Myers-Briggs personality test and know the people that you're going into business with so that way you can do exactly what Carlos said and make sure that you put them in a position to be successful. But at the end of the day, if it's not working and they're really affecting your bottom line and you're going from black to red, it's time to go. Yeah. That's really the time to, that's it. But having things in place, really, like documentation, documentation. As a teacher, or, um, Vanessa, I taught for 17 years. Nobody will black and white you more than an assistant principal and a principal. <laughs> Nobody will black and white you more than them. Everything is in writing. So that way, when you come to your evaluation, they got it down. And you have no rebuttal unless you was black and white them. That's the word we use in education. So basically it means keep good notes, record everything, write everything down. So that way you have documentation when you're having meetings with whoever, even if you're doing a collaboration, you're working with other businesses. It's important that you guys put everything in black and white. In other words, make sure you got the good contracts. At the end of the day, that's super important. Um, I'm coming around. My friend here, Rodney. I just, I just have a real quick question. Uh, do any of you all have more of an online presence? The reason why I ask, because like the product that me and my business partner deliver is not a physical product; it's more of a mental and social product, but it's online. Like my business, this is my business right here. I can scan your phone, and you go to my online site. How do you guys navigate through the e-commerce? Whoever who's online. Yeah, tell them about the chicken song. <laughs> I, I, think, I think we're still learning the game, but I mean, just for my experience, uh, we were we we looked at like I go back looking at the grades. Like we had an app early on, so like say pre-COVID, we had we were already on the app store. We had I took it in my mind. I was like, you know, I want to have an app. I want to be able available online, um, website stuff like that. So. When COVID hit, it kind of changed a lot of business minds 
because everybody wanted the app now. Everybody wanted because everything was order and delivery, yes, right? Mm -hmm. I was delivering on in a little smart car for three years. I drove around delivering on Fort Sam before DoorDash was was doing it. Before you know Uber Eats and stuff like that. So um, that that's where we start. You know, guerrilla marketing. We still do it. Um, so I, I think things like that has helped us be successful with our e-commerce when it when it comes to because like it's in your face. We we go out there. I still I used to be. Another, another, in my past life, I, uh, I'm, a, I'm a new from TSU. Anyone know about two little noobs? Um, we used to party promote. So we, I do the same principle that we did. We used to have to go fly the cars, right? So I, you know, me and my partner, that's what we, that's what we do. You know, that's that's our guerrilla marketing. We go out there, get in your face. Hey, come check us out. Try this new flavor of the month, so on and so forth. So and, and that just kind of brings that awareness to our online presence because hey, everything's on the website. Hey, check us out. But they see my face initially to to open that door. Right. And but my thing is, is is your product is actually a physical product. My product is more a feeling and social. It's like a social hub. It's like any type of Instagram, Facebook, anything like that. So it's more of a feeling versus an actual product that I put in your hand. Gotcha. So, so your product's an online product, right? Yes, sir. So this is the best way for you. Your objective is to build your brand awareness and to build your reach as fast as, as humanly possible. Exactly. You want to be online in front of people as many times as you possibly can. So the thing you need to master is marketing. You need to master social media marketing. If you don't want to do it yourself, you pay somebody else to do it. But you need to find out the best ways to get to your product in front of your consumer because you know your people. Yes, sir. So if you're looking at it from that aspect, you need to get into video, short form, short form video, reels, anything 15, 30 seconds. It's going to get your information out as fast as possible. You want to get into the advertising space, so actually learn how to run ads and not Facebook boosted posts. Right. Those are not ads. You need to be familiar with your with your business suite. So Facebook owns Instagram. Those two cohesively work together. So you want to know how to actually run ads, which type of ads you need. If you're going for conversion, if you're going for lead generation, whatever the aspect is, you need to find a coach, mentor, someone to talk to to get in-depth detail on social media marketing. That man right there, John Tron, he's got resources. You need to talk to him. All right. Thanks. Thank you, Carlos. Rodney Green. Hey, I just want to ask you guys, uh, what kind of adjustments have y'all made in these inflationary, inflationary like times and the new recession, what are some of the things y'all are doing to keep yourself recession proof to where you can keep your business where it's at or even take it to a higher height? Um, for, for me, I um, through COVID, you know, we, we had to shut down for seven weeks during COVID when COVID first hit. So from the beauty business industry, um, they shut us down completely. We couldn't do anything for seven weeks. Um, during that time, that was during the time that uh, George Floyd got killed. And so um, I can actually say that I see a lot of people that are in my industry that don't look like me that are closing their businesses. My business actually grew through COVID instead of being closed down. So um, I think that for me, I just make sure that I have the newest and most recent information on skincare, on massage techniques on nail care services and bringing that and putting that to the forefront. I'm a big marketer on social media. That's where a lot of people see me. It's in, in the Black Girl Magic group, the Black Queens SA group, those groups actually grew my business tremendously. And that's where a lot of people have seen me. A lot of people be like, oh, you're flawless. I'm like, no, my name is Marie. <laughs> but, um, but they know me as my business instead of knowing me by my name. And I'm okay with that because that's my brand. And I, I work really hard on social media to build my brand. Um, I'm not a big Instagram person, but I have some of my staff managing my Instagram more so. But social media, as far as Facebook, has been the way that I built my brand. And a lot of people actually follow me a long time. Like I have people that follow me six months to a year and then come into the spa. And so they were like, I've been following you for this long. But I think just communicating, um, showing yourself in social media, um, unfortunately, social media is the way that you have to go. You know, if you're not a computer person, then find somebody who can help you with it. But to grow your business and to scale your business in today's society, you have to be on social media in some way, shape, or form. No, nope, that is very true, and I think you have to figure out what where your people are. Yes. So it's not just get on any site. No, you have to be on the right social ones. media site where your target audience is. So that's super important, Marion. How you doing? My name is Marion. I'm a car salesman at Universal Toyota. And also, I work for the 3D Realty Group. Uh, my question is, how do you propel yourself when you go into a pitfall? When you like things are going against you and stuff like that? How do you propel yourself to get to the next level from there? You meditate. You 
say a prayer. And don't be afraid to be afraid, because I do everything scared. I'm going to tell you, <laughs> this expansion is costing me more money than I've ever invested in my business, and I'm scared to death to do it, but I know in the end it's going to work. So that's what you have to do. Hello, my name is Keanu Heron. I'm co-CEO of Mounting Up Home Services, also as a water softener specialist. And my question would be, how are some ways that I have overcame and what are some obstacles y'all over, well, y'all came as far as mental health? Mm -hmm. I know as business and entrepreneurship, it can be stressful and overwhelming. So what are some ways that y'all kind of delegate that with y'all mental health? Thank you. So, quickly, because I know these gentlemen might have something to say. As a woman, I have found out, I, I used to not believe in mental health issues. I used to always be like, oh, that's just an excuse for you not to be great or not to be successful. And I used to always tell this to my nephews because they truly had mental health issues, but because they were my family, I'm like, it can't be. You know, it's nothing wrong with you. But recently I went through a crisis where I had some mental health issues. And sometimes it's, it's out of your control, but it's you not ever giving up on you is what brings you through it. Like figuring out the support and the help and the therapy and, and your actual breakthrough. Like for me, I have so much business and I have so many people pulling on me. I found out that I have to be by myself for a little bit. So every day, I have to take 30 minutes. My whole family knows. I have a 4-year-old, a 10-year-old, a 14-year-old. They know, and they're boys. When I, mommy walked through the door, give me 30 minutes. Let me take my clothes off. Let me just unwind. I have to take that or I won't be right. I have to also take trips to get away from everybody. And it's two days. And I figured this out just on my own. I, I went out of town for work. They canceled the meeting, but I didn't cancel my flight. <laughs> so I was like, you know what, I don't care. I was at a hotel. I was in New York, and they said it was going to rain. I don't care. And it was the best two days of my life. I didn't do anything. Wasn't nobody asking me no questions. All my employees thought I was at work, so they didn't call me. I came back. I was a new woman. So you have to figure out for yourself what will work. Because I can't tell you that taking two days to New York is going to help you. Because you're like, girl, I'm going to come back, I'm going to be broke. No. <laughs> it's, 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 you have to figure out what helps you and don't give up on you. Because that's what, I, I mean, I was depressed, depressed. And everybody's like, you got everything going for you. And I'm like, I know, I can't even figure it out. I don't know why I'm not getting dressed and leaving my house. But once I snapped out of it, I had to begin to work on me so I wouldn't fall back into it. So as long as you don't give up on you, figure it out. And once you figure out, don't. Don't let anyone else tell you how to make you happy. What brings you peace? What brings you balance? Because balance for everybody doesn't look the same. I, I just want to say this really quick. All of us are people of color, and entrepreneurs of any color, they have some of the same struggles, but we have an additional uh, struggle and fight that we have to deal with. Black men and black women. And so it's really important to understand that we're physical, emotional, intellectual, and spiritual beings. And you have to feed every single one of those components. And in doing so, you will continue to help yourself. Self-care is a real thing. And so you have to, like she was saying, you got to take a moment, whether that's in the morning, I like that, for me that's in the morning, get my PT in, I exercise, I focus, I pray, I read my, my word. You have to do the things that's going to help you be consistent and sustain the work and the passion that you have. And, and you have to do that first. First and foremost, it's like when the uh, the thing comes out on the plane, you got to put it on your mouth first before you give it to the child. Mm -hmm. Really important that you take care of yourself. If I can just comment real quick, um, I uh, spoke at an event last weekend, and it was a panel discussion. And one of the things that the, one of the participants said was, I take 10 minute mini vacations every day. 10 minutes, she detaches, she closes her door, whatever. She said, I don't have to talk about anything. I 
may pray, I may sing, I may whatever. But she was like, in doing that, those 10 minutes, it allows her to just balance out, you know, be able to detach. Because I'm looking for a vacation with daytime with flashlight. I mean, like, like I'm, I'm going out of town next week. That's not vacation. That's business. You know what I mean? So I think that um, that's the only thing that keeps me going right now. It's those little mini vacations. So mental health, I, the, I had a therapist a couple of years ago just because I needed help with the struggle with entrepreneurship. And I think that we don't. We don't pay attention to that. It's hard out here. Yeah, it's hard. What is it? Talk out here for Kim. Hello, everyone. I'm Nicole John. I'm of Tax Max. I also sit on the board of Beta. <laughs> so I work in the financial service industry, and what I see with a lot of entrepreneurs is they got a plan to get in business, but they don't have a plan to scale their business. Most importantly, they don't have a plan to exit their business. Mm. Being that y'all have scaled y'all's business, what particular thing happened to make you know that you needed to reach out for help to scale or exit your business? So check it out. So to, to address your question, right, what made you realize you need help? I think that's one of the biggest things for us as entrepreneurs is we feel like we can do everything and we feel like we're, we're superhuman, right? Where I can do this, I can do this, I can do this, I can do this, I can do this. The thing for me that made me realize I need help is when I started to value my time more. So when you get into a space where you're doing everything by yourself, you lose track of time. You have no time left in the day to do anything. And if you care about the people that you care about, with your family, your friends, whatever the case may be, you decide at some point you're going to have to start delegating time. How do you get more time? You buy time. How do you buy time? You hire people. If you hire enough people, you don't have to work as harder. So if you can get to a space where you can start to delegate things and pay people to do the tasks that you don't need to physically give your attention to, then you can start to spend more time doing the things that you want. Whether it's travel, taking those vacations, things of that nature. But more importantly, like for me, I got into a space in my business where I was doing a lot. I mean, I'm, I'm doing stuff for the car dealership. I'm doing stuff for um, the real estate business. I'm doing stuff for my telecommunications company. I'm doing stuff for all these different things, right? I'm running four different businesses, throwing events, planning stuff, all that. And I got into a space where I was mentally beat down where I, every single day is like nonstop, nonstop, nonstop. But that's what I'll tell you, should be trying to make me take a break. <laughs> I'm such a grinder, I'm such a worker that I don't even like to take a break. So I realized and I got to the space where I understood, okay, you can't do everything. Hire somebody else to do it for you. If you can trust them, they have the skills and the knowledge. You put somebody else in that position to where they can actually do it and they're actually good at it. It's one thing to hire people. It's one thing to bring people on board. It's another thing to have the right people. And you want to start bringing the right people in to do the work for you that can kind of do it with your vision, your intent, your mindset. One more person can respond quickly. So, um, so I I have have been through where I've had a business, things didn't work out in that business. I had to exit that business. Um, either I had business partners that didn't work out. Um, I've had to fire business partners, um, and so I had to get to the point where I said, I'm going to focus on building myself, and then if I find somebody else that I can work with, then I'm going to do that. As far as like scaling, um, I'm scaling my business now. Um, I don't want to really exit right now. I'm 53 years old and I am self-employed completely. I don't work for anybody else. So this is me. Um, as far as scaling now, the part that I would end up wanting to scale is I'd want to step from behind the chair because now I still have clients. I, and I'm going to get to a point where I'm going to have just my clients that I currently have and those are the only ones I'm going to get and anybody else I'll feed off to my other estheticians that come in in the business. So I'm going to get to the point where I'm, I'm going to be full with my clientele and I'm going to stop and I'm going to start training. I'm going to start building another scale, another piece of my business is training new people, training people who want to learn a little bit more detail behind skincare and behind what I do. Um, helping them build their businesses. So it's just a, another facet of my business is just not client facing. Thank you, thank you. I'm gonna do a quick little check in. Um, are we all right? Y'all all right? Because a couple more people have questions. Y'all okay? All right. I just want to say, I'm uh, Bartender is killing this. <laughs> uh, bartender, ease up on them drinks, my friend. Ease up on them drinks. <laughs>
This is a little taller than me, but it's okay. Hi everyone, so my name is Sydney Gold, and this is my first time here. Um, so I have a very quick question. How did y'all know? So I just started a really amazing job at JBSA. So I met or Sam Lacken right off a little bit. The same time I started my new job, I actually launched my bakery, my whole bakery, in a state home. So much so that I mentioned one bakery item to um, a criminal today, and I walked out with two workers. So my question is, how do y'all know, how did y'all know when to leave your full-time jobs, or when to leave a job to go right into your business? Because I feel like I'm ready, but also this job is really good. Use that job. Yeah, for, for me, for me, um, man, it, it took me like, like actually, like. Hold on one second, Daryl. Let us respect the room, please. Respect the room. Go ahead, Daryl. For for me, um, it took it going back to my, my restaurant background. I was I was a waiter. I'll never forget, I had a whole degree, but I was a waiter at Papa Do's in San Antonio, and I had a restaurant that was open. And I would get text messages like, "Hey, asking questions," and I'm like I'm like in the break room, like, "Hey, I'm on the table," <laughs> and I feel like so it took me to have to have that conversation. And I, and I took I talked to my GM, and I was like, "Hey." I love it here, but um, I started a brand new business and I gotta focus on that because I mean they needed me, right? So I had to be there. Um, also, an another I I'm, a, I'm a veteran as well, so that that took me. So my my tenure in the in the military, I would get in trouble because uh, my first sergeant I used to print uh, wingy flyers on the <laughs> on a computer and uh, I would pass them out. Wow. So so that took another thing. I'm like, you know what, the military for me. I was reserved, but at the same time, when I'm on drill and stuff like that, I was doing wingy business. And you know, that's that. You know, if it ain't Uncle Sam, they don't they don't want nothing to do with that. So at the same time, but but my experience in there opened me up to oh, I can I can be on. So I, I had our first contract with APs from going through the military because it opened up my eyes. It was like so that that was a stepping stone to a whole new network of, of people that I didn't even know about. Uh, if that answers the question. Yes. But real quick, don't jump too soon. Yeah. Use your job to build your clientele. Yeah. And okay. then when you feel comfortable mm -hmm. and your check from bakery is more than, more than what okay. 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 it might be yeah. something to think about. But right now, yeah. build your clientele. Cook on the weekend. Yeah. Yeah. Use that season. Use the season that you're in to help build on. Thank y'all so much. Mm -hmm. As a financial advisor, I'll tell anybody looking to leave their job at least have six to twelve months of savings. Entrepreneurs don't think like that. That's why I'm here. They need me on their team. Everyone needs me. You're right. That's the right way. Right. Hi, my name's Natasha. I'm a realtor. Um, my question to the panel is. Think back to that first year, just getting into the business. Um, I'm new to San, semi-new to San Antonio, originally from New York, moved here from Florida. So I'm learning my San Antonio demographic. Um, so speaking of target audience, your target market, how did you discover who your target market is? And finding them, approaching them, how did you even start that, that first year out the gate? That makes sense. Liam, I think that's a good question for you. <laughs> um, well, my restaurant, the concept of it was, was health, healthy food, lifestyle. So when I found my location where I was at, it's right on the running track. It's like a, it's a bur the, the start of a 10 mile running track along the river, uh, San Antonio River. So in order for someone to get on that track, they have to park where my restaurant is and then go. So um, I thought that was like the perfect place to, to start, even though it was kind of small, tucked in. Um, it was perfect. The, the, the rent lease was low enough to where it wasn't, you know, that scared to, to jump into it, um, which gave me an opportunity to make a lot of mistakes and, and correct a lot of things. So um, now we, we feel that we're, we're able to expand and take off on the other market. If, if we probably went somewhere else, another larger brick and mortar place, you know, um, at the rim or something like that, it, it, we probably would have failed, definitely, because we, we made way too many mistakes. 
<laughs> on everything. So, um, you know, you just kind of got to get in that perfect location, be patient, um, and find your target market in there and, and go from there. Hi, my name is Yashika, and um, first I want to say thank you so much for coming out here and sharing your experiences with us because this has been uh, an eye-opener for me. So I appreciate you taking the time to come and share your stories with us. Um, to what you said, I wish I had the opportunity to put back funds um, to start a business. However, I did not know COVID was coming. I did not know that I was going to be laid off from my job. Um, so I did not have a plan B because I wasn't expecting COVID. My plan B was um, I went back to school, um, got my real estate license, never thought about real estate until a friend brought it to my attention, so that's what I did. My first year I sold not one house, not one. This year I sold five so far. <laughs> So now I am ready to venture off into um, a new endeavor, which is um, real estate investing. But I have not a single clue of how to get into it, or uh, what to do. That's why I'm trying to befriend her and get more insight and participate in things like this, where I can be in the in the same environment as people that can teach me. My question to you is, however. When you first started your businesses, I know we all get those rejections. We all get those 100 no's before we get that one yes. What was that like for you starting your business? Were you, did you get rejected with your ideas? And when you finally got that yes, was that the breaking point for you? Thank you. So I, I, I want Sharika to answer that question from just because she is um, in a male-dominated field, and as a woman in construction, that's really a big deal, and especially going after government contracts. So can you kind of um, answer her question a little bit? <laughs> so thinking back, and I, honestly, I've really been blessed in my business being a woman in construction. But my nose didn't come from reject, rejection. It was more of not being prepared. So I always thought of it as a blessing in disguise. You know, not having um, the right bonding or the right insurance or, you know, not submitting all of the information they asked for in a proposal or getting to the table late. So. I didn't get the, no, you didn't get it. It was more of, no, you're not ready. So I just used that as information that I needed to be a better company, you know, to, to be in a better place. And it gets you down because you want to make money. You want the next gig. You want the next job. But sometimes you have to think of it as everything is not meant for you and God is protecting you from something. So when you have that mindset, you don't give up. You just figure out, okay, how do I do better next time? And I was on it. I was submitting everything to everybody, and that's when I had to figure out alignment was important because everything wasn't good. All money wasn't good money. So just be careful. Like, all rejection is not bad rejection. And to me, I always used it as, you know, ammunition to be a better person or a better company. I have one thing to say. Okay, I'll say ahead. this real quick. Um, and this would probably be like after the George Floyd incident. And this would be my best advice is don't be afraid to use the black card. Yes. Yes. Ooh. Oh, oh, don't be afraid. Oh, hold up, hold up. Say, say that one more time. Don't be afraid. Say that one more time for the people in the back. Yeah, that's it. Don't be afraid to use it, especially when you're dealing with um, these large corporations. For example, um, uh, Uber Eats. They came to me, they like, hey, we want you to use Uber Eats. Uh, what's the commission? 30%. No, I'll, I'll be out of business dealing with that. I'm not doing it. Lowest we can do is 20%. We can't do any lower than that. I'm like, no, nope, I'll just have to go on my own. I'm not doing it. I'm like, if you give it down to 15%, then I'll do it. Oh, we got to talk to our boss. And this, I'm like, is this how Uber is treating minority black businesses? <laughs> 
And it was like, oh, let me, let me talk to my boss. And let me see. And I was like, I'll wait. I'll wait to hear back from you. So when they came back, and he was like, we've never done this before, but we'll go ahead and do it. 15%. So I took that contract. All the rest of them started con contacting me, DoorDash. And they're like, oh, no, we can't do it. We can't do it. You know, 22% is the lowest we can go. I'm like, well, Uber Eats did it for 15. I'll send you my contract. So every delivery service, Uber Eats, Grubhub, DoorDash, Favor. Now Walmart has a new one called Joy something. They just contacted me. I sent them all that. All of my um, delivery services are 15%. All because I pulled the black card on them. Send me your contract. So the thing about this is that he knew when to do it. Yeah. Yeah. It's not something that you just go around you pulling yeah. the black card. But what I will say, going back to, again, um, contracting and being certified, that's why most, the sure you correct me if I'm wrong, most federal, state, and local entities have swimming requirements. And they're supposed to literally be seeking us out. They actually hire people called diversity, what are, Program what's, diversity. Yeah. what's the diversity and what? Inclusion. 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 Yeah, diversity and inclusion. Like that's a whole position at a lot of these major companies. Their job is to seek us out. But again, it goes back to us doing our part, making sure that we're following yeah. our taxes, mm -hmm. that we have an LLC, that we have insurance, all of these things so that way we get in the system. So that way when University Health System put out a bid for a restaurant, we're ready. When VIA is looking for a cleaning company, we're ready. So it goes back to all of those things about being prepared as well. And then you know they have swimming requirements. So that's when you definitely pull out the black cards on a contract. Like, let me see, when the, when's the last black person y'all hired that got this contract? So it's also a lot about, which Global Shriek and everybody said up here, about mentorship, knowing when to pull the black card. So you just can't do it all willy-nilly. And then you, when they start, you know, your name starts getting sprayed around and nobody want to fool with you. Mm -hmm. So you have to be strategic about yeah, exactly. it. Exactly. Um, Azui. Azui. I have a question for you specifically because um, I want to know, like, what, how do you navigate a field that is, like, male-dominated? Like, my field itself isn't, uh. but, like, the niche I'm a part of, like, to be honest, there's a, like, it's pretty male-dominated. So that's, like, my biggest question. That's, that's one of the things, like, there's a lot, a lot of dudes that are really, really helpful, but overall, it's kind of hard, like, one, not seeing many people that look at me, but not even seeing many females, but it does kind of get to me sometimes, so I'm just wondering how you, like, it gets to you like I love walking in a room when I'm the only man. So you you have to be really comfortable in yourself. Like I educate myself all the time. Like I'm never gonna be in a room and not be able to speak intelligent about what it is that I'm selling you. And when you're sitting in a room, no matter what they look like and who they are, if you're comfortable in yourself. You're gonna be in a winning situation every single time. Like you, you have to. It has to be about you. When you walk in the door, it has to be about you. When I walk in my kids' daycare, it's about me. Like you, it, it has to be about you first before anybody else will care. And I, and I just think, you know, get you some mentors that are women, and they'll help you through that as well because it's just that that motivation and that support that someone like you could give you that you couldn't get from a man. Like I have a lot of men mentors. They're all assholes, <laughs> but they help me grow. But that's not who I'm going to for support. Well, do you have any advice on finding on finding like female mentors? That's been super hard for me. Like I've been looking. What industry are you in? Art, <laughs> animation. Oh my god, y'all are everywhere. Yeah. Well, you would think, but like a lot of the women that are in art aren't in animation. A lot of them are painters, and a lot of them do traditional art straight. But for my specific niche, that's why I said like overall, it's really not a male dominated field, but my niche is, so it's really hard to find a mentor for animation that is not. So right now, finding people is it, it's the e the yes. easiest way to find people today. It's social media. Network groups. So, yeah, so when you go on Facebook and network, you're typing in what it is that your niche is and what you're looking for, and you find all these different people, find the most successful one, and then you start contacting and asking questions and commenting and liking things that they're doing, showing interest. 
But social media is the best way for you to find anybody you want right now. And your mentor doesn't have to be, so let's let's not put that narrative out there. Your mentor does not have to be the same sex as you. Like, at the end of the day, I'm a mentor to a few male entrepreneurs, as well as my mentor is a guy. Both of my mentors are guys. Like, very successful um, black male entrepreneurs, to be exact. So, let's not... Let's not delve in that space that your mentor needs to be the same sex as you. But I do understand as a woman sometimes with a male mentor, you may feel like you gotta you gotta navigate some murky waters sometimes, but a real mentor wouldn't even try you no way. And have as, multiple as in, as mentors. And have multiple mentors. Have multiple. Have mentors true. in different areas that they strive in. So like a lot of my mentors are business. So that's why they men. Business infrastructure. I'm looking at them to show me how to scale, show me how to exactly. make money, show me what market to be in. A lot of my mentors are white. White males that are making a lot of money. So they're cutthroat and they don't care, but they help me get out of the funk of wanting to care. Like, I want to be a mom, I want to help, and I want to support. And they're like, hell no, it's time to make money. And, you know, it's your opportunity. You're a unicorn in what you do. You need to spread your wings. Like, they're pushing me the way I don't want to be pushed. Right. And then I have mentors that'll be like, you know what? <laughs> so it'll be a little bit Polish, but you do need mentors that will support and help you where you want to go. And they might not, it might not be just one person. That's true. Dexter and then Anthony, then we're going to wrap it up. Hey, thank you all. I'm going to make this quick because I got I to gotta jump on a quick conference call, but I got to hats off. I am very impressed. I am very, very, I mean, I had to take stuff off of my plate to make this. And I think that was the best decision I made tonight. Because I am proud to see what I call black enterprise intellect in this in this panel. And I'm not talking about a young black, male and female. See, I'm a successful entrepreneur, but I got off to a very late start. I'm looking at the youth, the next generation. See, I don't want to pass my baton or pass my torch. I would have used my torch to light somebody else's torch. So that when mine finally flame out, yours is an inferno. And I want to encourage you to keep on keeping on and keep on reaching out and teaching. Thank you. Anthony, uh, you got a question? I did. Uh, one of the things y'all talked about very well is about knowledge. So I know you talked about good and great. Any other books that we should be reading? Uh, about business and what we can do, some of the things that y'all put in the picture that we can write down that we can actually work on ourselves to go talk. Make you grow rich. Make you grow rich, that's a good one. The Alchemist. The Alchemist. Mm -hmm. Scaling. Balls and moves. Rich dad, poor dad, someone said. Take the stairs. Take the stairs, that was one. Somebody. Yeah, it's rude. To the next world. Laws and human nature. Who moved my cheese? That is a good one. Atomic habits. Atomic habits. Anybody can do it. Can you do it? Can we put these books on the page? We'll put up a post. These are really good books. I'm not really all about that reading shit. No, 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 if you want to know some shit, you put it in a book. And what they say, black people don't fucking read. So, so let's, let's, let's talk about that, though. But when I read 10X, that 10X rule, I made like 600000 in one year. So, like, let, let, let's talk about numbers. We don't, we don't read. Let's be honest. We don't, we don't read. So, like, this is important. So, like, we should really put that on there. And Audible, get the Audible app. Click download one book, but every time when you delete a book, they'll give you a free book. So you don't even have to pay the money for it. It's free, but how do we know that? Knowledge is power. This is why we have these groups. This is why we talk, so we can attain this knowledge, so we can, you know what, tell other people, hey, this is what we need to do. 
We, we need to read, we need to expand our knowledge. This is a little talk right here, so I'm just sorry. He came through, he came through. getting into a productive state that's key you don't want to overeat because if you overeat it changes your whole entire body digestive slows everything down so you just want to eat enough to to feel a sense of fullness but not to be completely full to where you're going to go to sleep mental read personal development i live by that so whatever books that you're reading regardless if it's an audible book or youtube whatever the case may be you need to do something to stimulate your own personal growth and your own personal development spiritual just gratitude that's it 100 and, and a thousand percent gratitude. I'm in a space where I'm in, I have so much peace in life because I'm extremely grateful for everything that I have. And it doesn't reflect, um, it's not It's not a materialistic thing. It's just truly and honestly peace. And peace is beyond understanding. So for me, I have so much peace and I'm grateful every single day. I find something to be grateful in and less to complain about. The more gratitude you have, less attitude you have. So that's it. Awesome. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So thank you guys again so much. Well, let's give him a round of applause. Um, so I actually know each of these people individually and have my own relationship with each person. And I just want to say thank you for um, trusting me to put you in this position uh, to be able to share. Because I think each of you brought something very unique. Um, excuse me. Thank you. Thank you. Let's be respectful. Thank you. So each of you really brought something different to this panel, and I really hope that you guys, just by show of hands, like, did you learn something that you didn't know before you walked through those doors? Do you feel like you can take some of these things that they said and implement them in your business? Now, we all know that education, sometimes we're bombarded with a lot of stuff on social media, so it's very important that we take the things and actually implement them, but put in a process to implement. You don't have to do them all in one day. But actually, there's no point if you come in here and spend three hours with us if you're not going to do any of the things that was mentioned here. 
And I just want to say, which I would harp on it again, what Sharika said, that most of the a mentor is very, very important. I personally don't believe you meet your mentor. Just putting up social media posts looking for a mentor is really the best way. I really do believe that you go out there and you build a relationship with someone and you get to know them because you need to be mentorable. That is a word. You need to be mentorable. It is a word. But when you ask people that's on this panel that have scaled and built a six or seven figure business to mentor you and you don't take heed to what they say, that's like, really though? I don't even know a word for it right now. But it's rude. It's not nice. It's a lot of things. It's all bad. Right. So time is money. Time is money. So these, so if you do connect with them, um, I definitely encourage you to connect with them once this is over. Get their contact info, whatever they're willing to share, because they all do come with a wealth of information and are actually currently in the trenches, just like you, just in a different way. We can definitely help you um, progress your business. So as far as Bita is concerned, we are working. <laughs> we are working tirelessly, tirelessly. To really bring the organization full circle and get it to where it's doing what it's supposed to do and providing the value and providing services to you as entrepreneurs. So we ask for a little grace and patience. You will be getting an email here soon about joining Vita and what that looks like. But while you're here at the Moab Center, because I know Terrence had to leave, this is the only black co-working space in San Antonio. Up. The only. There are 52 offices on the other side of this wall and an uh, event center, a, um, a lounge area, um, a kitchen. We had our uh, black business luncheon uh, for doing Black History Month. We had our luncheon there. Uh, the, the event center is about at least 150 plus people. So you don't have to meet at Starbucks anymore. We have, this is for us. As you can see, the people on the wall, they've been very intentional about how they decorate the Greenwood. This is the Greenwood, um, which is a business incubator. And then on the other side of this wall are the offices of the event center. Right now, they are doing a special for um, $50 a month that you have access to the whole facility. And then there's two options. So one is $50 a month, and there's one that is $100 a month. And you get a mailbox, I think, with that one. Also, but what's going out? Do you have the information? Okay. So we will get the information out to you so you don't have to be in Starbucks if you don't want to. There's a nice co-working space right on the other side of this wall that you can bring your clients to, that you can use as your office address, which ultimately makes you look more professional uh -huh. at the end of the day. So my last thing before we end, um, if you have a business card, if you don't mind, just drop it here. Um, here on this table, we will send out an email letting you know about upcoming events. We do have one more event in this series for August. So just in case you don't know, August is National Black Business Month. It is a real thing. Okay, so August is National Black Business Month. So we did a trilogy. So this is event number two. The third event is literally next Thursday. And it's called Tap In. And Tap In is a seminar on all things small business. So we'll have speakers from the Chamber, um, from Lift Fund, from the Moad, um, also uh, one more other person is coming to, uh, Charles will be there speaking on certification. But we're gonna be talking about everything that small business to make sure that you are successful in growing and scaling your business. So that should be verbiage and language that you should use on a regular basis, growing and scaling. And growing and scaling looks like hiring people with a W-2. <laughs> 1099 is cool too, but when you really Grow and scale, you're not putting yourself in a position to like have employees. And that's really super important. That lets you know like, ooh, we really, you really there. It's a, it's a sticker shock, I'm sure, when you first get that first W-2 employee. But growing and scaling is about having staff. So we wanna make sure that we can help you and be your foundation to be able to do that in any way possible. So again, thank you guys for coming. Again, I didn't think nobody was gonna show up. Yeah. But I showed up. What did I tell you last week? I, what, okay, what, what did you say? Space. Huh? We're eventually going to run out of space. We are eventually going to run out of space. So next time we will be over in the event center. Because um, I like to have people register so I, I can be prepared. That's so, I, I know, black people don't register. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, when we, when we buy alcohol and spending money and food, I like to know at least how many people are coming. 
But thank you again. Um, I, again, I hope this was very informative for you. Um, be sure to go and like the Facebook page on Vita. There's um, tasers, teasers, teasers. So make, make sure you guys connect with them. I hope the food was really good. And the peach cobbler was by Stephanie Gray. Um, she made that for me, so or for us. So thank you. Um, also, get with um, Trey with Is the City if you're looking to get your business online. So it's a lot of great resources. So y'all got about a good about 10 to 15 minutes to possibly to possibly get connected with these people because then we gotta we gotta lock out. 10 minutes. 10 minutes. 10 minutes. <laughs> Follow the show, Brandy Davis on Facebook, Instagram.